Energy again. You, you, you mentioned also, you know, the emphasis on the packaging we were talking about. And I think that's one of the things that, that people forget because these days the emphasis seems to be on downloading people saying it's the death of the CD. Hmm. But not only do you get much better sound quality on CD, but of course you get the fabulous packaging. Well, absolutely. Which, which so many labels are doing now in terms, especially on catalogue. And so I think partly what we're doing is we are emphasising the future of the CD by, by doing what we're doing here. I, I think the CD will always stay, just as vinyl hasn't gone away. Um, I think CDs will, will always be around. And I think um, if any label is to sort of uh, stand, keep its head above water uh, in this age of downloads, you have to package things well. And I think also the sort of people who would certainly buy um, the material that Esoteric releases, I think they, they would expect packaging to be of a high standard. Um, and they expect the audio to be well remastered as well and, and for everything to be as, as, as good as possible because they're from a, an era when uh, buying an album um, meant that you actually got a, a, a piece of art as well in a 12 inch square. Scene. And it was an event, wasn't it? When yes. we were younger, buying an album, it was, you know, you can remember when you buy certain albums. Absolutely, yes. And that's, that's that sort of thing. And so you're trying to recreate that. Someone, in, in many cases, a lot of people um, who buy our products don't have the vinyl anymore, or they've, they've lost it over the years. And then buying the CD is one of those things that they, you know, for them that's an event as well, if you've recreated everything. Um, I think a fine uh, case in point was um, we reissued uh, Mann's album, uh, Be Good to Yourself at Least Once a Day, which when it came out in 1972, opened up and it had a pop-up map of Wales inside it, uh, a cartoon uh, map of Wales with uh, some, some very amusing uh, comments and things like that on there. And there was also um, uh, a Mann family tree which came inside the whole, in, inside the inner bag of the album. And when we came to uh, um, reissue that album, Lots of fans got in touch and said, I bet you won't be able to reproduce that. And so we, uh, yeah. we had a, Phil Smee and myself had a good think about that one. And uh, we did manage to reproduce the, the Map of Wales. It's a little poster yes. that came yeah. out there. Yeah. And I think, and that went down exceptionally well with fans and they loved it. Um, so those sort of things matter as much as the musical content sometimes to people. So. Uh, yeah, and you've also, you've also released Space Ritual's latest album. That's right, yeah, the, the studio album by uh, Space Ritual, which is a band of, of ex-Hawkway members, Nick Turner, uh, Mick Slattery, T uh, Terry Ollis, Thomas Crimble, and, and uh, it was an album that Nick um, sent me a CDR of, and, and uh, I was really quite shocked at how good it was, actually. I thought it was, it, for me, it was the sort of album that, Hawkwinds haven't made for years and it, it really is a, a nod back to I think classic Hawkwind albums like Warrior on the Edge of Time and things like that with, with poetry, um, poems from Mike Moorcock on there and that kind of stuff like that and it really is, it really is a strong record and uh, again that's been really well received so I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased that again a lot of people thought that was a, that was a worthwhile project. Because Esoteric really is a, is a catalogue label but you are open to the uh to some new, Absolutely, new I, I think you know it's it's um, it's interesting because uh, a lot of the musicians that we who, that we know and people that we reissue, they're still out there making records, and a lot of them are still making very good music. Um, they the major labels may not be interested anymore, but there's still a strong fan base for a lot of this. And uh, I think, as you rightly said as well uh, earlier, you know you don't just think of Britain as your marketplace you think of the world as your marketplace now for all this kind of thing yes yeah and if you look at the audience globally for this kind of stuff i think then um, ultimately it's still worthwhile doing it so um every so often we'll be doing occasional uh, new albums by people with with the uh, solid fan bases and uh, i think people like to see that as well so it keeps everything interesting as far as i'm concerned <laughs> anyway and uh as I said, I think uh, the, the way it's, it's uh, being part of the Cherry Red family is a fantastic thing and it's, it's given us a, an opportunity to really um, go in and, in and look at projects we wouldn't have been able to look at otherwise. So uh, it's something I'm, I'm really, really happy with. And, and, we, and you've taken over looking after the, the Claire Hamill catalogue as well, haven't you? That's right. Um, I got in touch with Claire um, 
after I found out that she, uh, she actually owns all her catalogue now, so the material she recorded for Island Records and she also recorded for Ray Davis's Conk label in the mid-70s. All those albums had, had reverted to Claire. And um, I, f I found her via MySpace, which is, which is uh, quite interesting. And uh, I said that, that's usually the way that, that people find new bands. It is. So you can also find catalogues. So catalogue, yeah, yeah, that's exactly how yeah. we found Claire. And yeah. I sent Claire a message via her MySpace page and she phoned me up. And uh, so um, I went to see her. Um, had a, we got on really well. And uh, she said, well, I'd, I'd like you to have a look at doing, doing the catalogue. So... Um, that's why the catalogue uh, came over to Esoteric, and um, it started off last year with a, a compilation album, which had uh, sort of which was a best of, of career retrospective of all her stuff. But um, we're just bringing out um, the two al al albums she recorded for Island Records: One House Left Standing and um, October. On One House Left Standing, Claire also managed to find some um, unreleased material as well. We've got uh, a version of her doing Lindisfarne's Meet Me on the Corner, where the bands are right. Steeler's Wheel. Right. And Jerry, Jerry Rafferty Jerry is, and is, is, yeah. is singing yeah. a duet with Claire on it, yeah. and it's fantastic. Yeah. So um, that's, that's been added as a bonus track. And um, Claire's actually uh, doing a, a tour of uh, folk clubs and art centres in April this year. So uh, it's, um, again, the, the music press as well have been really kind to, to, uh, to us and uh, I think um, it's been a pleasure doing those albums and so we're going to get the rest of the Claire Hamill catalogue out throughout the rest of the year. Um, and it's lovely when you can actually find an artist who has got all their own catalogue then because you can work closely with them and make sure it's done properly and, and uh, to everyone's satisfaction, which is, which is nice. And Michael Moorcock you're working with too? That's right, yes. We've just, um, just finished uh, work on uh, an album called The New World's Fair, which was originally released by United Artists in 1975. And uh, it, it's an interesting record, actually. It had about a two-year gestation period. It started off as an idea that um, Doug Smith, who managed Hawkwind, had, and he was, uh, because of Mike's um, collaborations with Hawkwind, he suggested that Mike would like to do um, an album and so it grew, it grew out of a demo of a track called Dodgem Dude, where people like Nick Turner of Hawkwind and Simon King of Hawkwind played on it. And uh, it took about another 18 months to come to fruition, but then it turned into a sort of a conceptual piece on, based on Mike's writings. And it's a really interesting album, actually. I'm probably a little too far ahead of its time. It's almost got a new wave feel to it rather than a, a sort of a 1975 feel to it. But um, it was really nice being able to do that. Um, and we found uh, six bonus tracks there, various demos and uh, alternate versions of things. And uh, Mike sent us a very nice email last week actually saying how, um, how much he appreciated what we'd done with the album, which was really nice. So uh, um, again, it's always worthwhile when people actually uh, appreciate, appreciate what, you, what yeah. you've done with their music. And I know one project you're very excited about, which is a little bit in the future, is this... Uh, six CD box set with Jack Bruce. That's right, yeah. Which you've been working on for a long time, haven't you? That's right. I mean, I, I, I was lucky enough to work with Jack uh, back in 2003 um, when I worked on all the Polydor reissues of his solo albums. And I'd always been a massive fan of Jack's solo work um, and felt that it, was, it deserved far more attention, really, than, than some of the Cream material. It was, it was very, very inventive music. And... Um, Jack and I got on, got on exceptionally well, and it was one of those things, uh, I was on holiday last year, and uh, I read um, a little interview, I think in Mojo or somewhere, that Jack had done, a little snippet about something else. And then I realised that Jack's uh, 65 in uh, May 2008, and I thought, well, no one's ever really collected recordings of all those various artists that Jack has played. I mean, really, is, I, I think... Uh, as much as sort of a father of British rock as, as a lot of other people. He's played with so many great people. Uh, and I thought it would be a really interesting uh, project to actually start back in 1962 with his material that he recorded uh, for Alexis Corners Blues Incorporated and just go all the way through up to the present day, just demonstrating how diverse Jack had been musically and, and the various musical styles that he performed from blues to jazz to rock to sort of avant-garde music. Um, and 
I went to see Jack last year and discussed the idea with him and I was really happy that he thought it was a fantastic idea and I presented him with a track listing which he made one change of one song right. yeah. and I thought that that was that was that was really nice as well that he, uh, we were on the same wavelength so uh, yeah that's coming together nicely and hopefully that will be out at the very beginning of June um, and uh, it's got Jack's full involvement on that great yeah so uh, we, we have to wrap up in a few minutes, but I just one, one thing I wanted to ask you was about suggestions. You like getting suggestions from the public, don't you? Any, anybody I think that's got really ideas? important. Yeah. Yes, in fact, some of the titles that we've actually uh, um, put out recently, um, we did an album called uh, I Spider by Webb, which has just come out. It was a, 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 a late 60s, early 70s prog rock gem. That was a result of so many people sending me emails that we should do that. And uh, I'd never heard the album before. When I finally got to hear it, I, I absolutely loved it as well. Managed to track down the keyboard player in the band, because uh, the band owned the album. And that one uh, has, has proven to be a case in point that uh, on people's recommendation, it's actually done, done pretty well. And it's a great record. I'm really pleased that we've got it as part of the catalogue. So if anyone's got any suggestions... Okay, including things uh, you might not have heard of yes, before. Yes, exactly, including yeah. things that I didn't yeah, know. Yeah, that's just quite um, remarkable, really. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm sure there's still a lot out there that I've yeah. never heard. So if anyone okay. has any suggestions, we do welcome them, and uh, we will, you know, any suggestions will be taken seriously, and we'll look into it. Okay, thank you, Mark. Well, thank you very much for watching the interview with uh, Mark Powell from Esoteric Records, and thank you for watching Cherry Red TV. Goodbye. <laughs>